What is going on guys, it's Modded Warfare here. Welcome back to another PS4 and PS5 news update. So in this video, we finally have part two of the Mastercore exploit revealed by Seaturt. So back in September of 2022, we got the first part of the Mastercore exploit, which has resulted in us being able to run PS2 ISOs on the PS4 and PS5 up to the latest firmware, also including PS2 homebrew applications and also emulators that were designed to run within the PS2. So this is done by exploiting the PS2 emulator that runs on the PS4 and PS5 through a save game exploit in a PS2 game called Okaji Shadow King. So you can use the exploit in this PS2 game to exploit a vulnerability in the actual PS2 emulator, which can then allow you to sideload other PS2 ISOs. And we've been using that for a while now thanks to Macaulay, who actually released a working implementation of it. So we've been waiting for part two for a long time because CTERT did also mention in part one that it would potentially be possible to sideload native apps with further development on the exploit. That would include potentially PS4 games and even PS4 homebrew, that kind of stuff. So that's what we've been hoping for up until now. And we now have part two release. Now it's a bit bittersweet because unfortunately it is incomplete. Part two was never finished because Seaturt is leaving the PlayStation hacking community. And so he's decided to just release this up to the point that he's managed to get to so far. And it would appear that he's not going to continue developing this. Maybe he'll come back at some point, but at the moment it doesn't seem like it. But because we actually have this release now, it does hopefully mean that other hackers in this scene might be able to pick up the torch and actually see this through to the end. So anyway, we're going to take a little look at this here because there are some interesting implications from this. There's some good news, there's some bad news. I'm not going to go through all of the technical details that are in here because there's a lot of stuff in here. It's going to take a long time to go through all of it. If you want to read the whole thing yourself, I'll leave a link to it down in the video description. We're just going to be picking certain things out here that are important. So to begin with, he says in this article, I'll explain how I used context to attack the compiler process with the goal of gaining fully arbitrary native code execution on the PS5, not just ROP. So right here, he says that the emulator consists of two separate processes and we have so far taken over the application process in part one but needs to also take over the compiler process in order to be able to run uh, arbitrary native code on the PS5. Now he talks about the PS5 mostly here, but I think most of this also applies to the PS4 as well. So if we scroll down a bit further, he discovered three vulnerabilities. Vulnerability one, pointers in shared memory. Vulnerability two is an out of bounds write in manually inject function. And he also found another vulnerability, which is also an out of bounds write in write relative jump. Now, vulnerability three is the one that he decided to take further. He says vulnerability three is much more attractive because of its stride 0x10 is a factor of the page size. So the offsets within different pages that we can corrupt will be consistent across different runs. Then he has a section on locating the heap. And then down here, this is as far as he basically got here. So we get to unfinished. He was never able to finish the exploit. But when summarizing the primitives outlined already, it seems reasonable that it would be possible to develop this into a complete exploit, taking over the compiler process. So this is kind of bittersweet that he wasn't able to finish it, but he does outline the process that somebody else could take to manage to see this through to the end. So as you can see here, he says being able to place large amounts of arbitrary data into the compiler at a known address using the bridge shared memory. Defeating ASLR, which is address space layout randomization uh, of the compiler's binary section through leaked pointers in the bridge. Having an out of bounds write vulnerability that spans the entire heap. Writing out of bounds into the heap to corrupt instruction mapping cache and using an oracle to determine which index was corrupted to learn the exact base address of the heap. So that is essentially what is required. However, we now get to the aftermath where there's a bit of bad news here. So this is where we look at what PlayStation actually did with this vulnerability to try and mitigate the issue. So as he says here, as described in my previous post, for various reasons, the operating system was not designed to enforce games to be on their latest version. And so the fact that there are games with special privileges is an oversight in their security model as it leaves privileged code with no readily available mechanism to be patched. As he predicted, PlayStation decided not to redesign their security model and build a mechanism for enforcement of game patches. 
Instead, they have accepted the reality that JIT compiler processes potentially being permanently compromisable and attempted to limit the consequences of this. Whilst I can only speculate on PlayStation's motivations, I believe their main concern regards the theoretical scenario of this being used to load patched retail PS4 games into the process and trying to boot them. PlayStation decided that they could mitigate this risk by placing a limit on the amount of JIT code allocatable. The limit is 65 megabytes. So this is the downside right here. So PS5 firmware 6.00 and equivalent for PS4, which I believe is 10.00 on the PS4 because they came out around the same time. They introduced a new global variable. So uh, allocated JIT memory towards limit. So they introduced this new memory limit of 65 megabytes um, that can be allocated. So this limit only applies to PS4s and PS5s that are on 6.00 or 10.00 or higher. But the problem is the chances that you have a PS4 or PS5 that's on a lower firmware than 6.00 and 10.00 and that actually has a licensed copy of Okaji Shadow King on it from when that firmware that you're on was the latest firmware and you had the foresight to download Okaji Shadow King on that system and still have the license files and everything on there. That's going to be a very, very tiny percentage of people that actually are in that situation and the people that are on say 4.50 or lower that are using that current uh, kernel exploit that we have on there it doesn't really apply to you either because you can't get okaji shadow king running on your system because we can't run like fake packages on those older firmwares and we can't get the licensed copy of the game because you're not on the latest firmware to download it so really it's the chances that you know you're going to be in that situation is very very small so what does this mean for people who are on higher firmwares that are on 6.00 or 10.00 or higher? Is there still hope? So the thing is, the 65 megabyte RAM budget will certainly stop you from running PS4 games on the system. However, PS4 Homebrew will probably be able to run maybe some other emulators like a RetroArch port or something that will be able to run other games. Stuff like that's possible. As stated further down here from CTERT, there are a couple of mitigations that could be used, hopefully, to allow us to still be able to run something like a PS4 game, even with this new limit that Sony has imposed, the 65 megabyte limit. So as said here, patch implications, the mitigation does indeed prevent you from loading large programs completely into memory all at once, but is that strictly necessary for them to run? There are a couple of tricks that come with some performance overhead, but I believe would make it possible to run larger amounts of code than the imposed limit. So before we get into these two methods, we need to kind of understand the JIT compiler a little bit. So JIT is the just-in-time compiler. It's the type of compiler the PS4 and PS5 is using. And the thing about this is that it's kind of like a highly optimized compiler or it's a very efficient type of compiler. Uh, where I believe it kind of optimizes things on the fly while it's compiling. So it can basically, you know, look at stuff that is particularly um, heavy on the CPU, for example, or certain functions that are being called constantly over and over again, or certain, you know, for loops and stuff that are running constantly or very often. It kind of optimize the compilation process for those specific functions that are being called, those loops, those things that are heavy on the CPU in order to basically make things run a lot faster, maximize performance essentially. So in here he says, not all code is constantly required. It could be dynamically paged in as needed. A more sophisticated approach could even use profiling to identify hot paths and prioritize using, using the JIT budget for those to maximize performance. So essentially, instead of taking that whole program, like an entire PS4 game and trying to just you know, dump it directly in and compile the entire thing with the JIT compiler, which would definitely be over the 65 megabyte budget. Instead of doing that, you could page it instead, where you basically split the program into multiple smaller chunks and then just load those chunks in as they are required. So as it's trying to execute a certain thing, if it's not in the current page, it can swap the page out for the page that does contain that piece of code or that function that needs to be executed. I believe that's essentially what he's talking about here. And then also profiling to identify hot paths and prioritize using the JIT budget for maximum performance. So you could basically identify certain parts of the code that are very heavy on the CPU or that are being called a lot or that are being used a lot. And you could prioritize those to be loaded within the JIT budget, within the 65 megabyte budget, so that it would allow for better performance. So you wouldn't 
it would minimize the performance lost of the technique. So that is one potential option. And then you have option two. So option two, the 65 megabyte JIT budget could be used to write an efficient x86-64 emulator in native x86-64. So yeah, instead of essentially loading the entire program into the 65 megabyte uh, JIT budget, you can instead essentially write an efficient x86 or 64 emulator that will emulate the particular like functions and stuff that the program needs to use and load the emulator into the JIT budget instead and then have the emulator handle the running of the program. Well, maybe not the whole program, but at least the parts of the program that are not able to fit within the 65 megabyte limit. The problem with that is that it's gonna run much, much slower than it would run normally in the JIT compiler. But he does say here, specifically in other platforms where JIT is limited, we've seen an interesting technique of using weird machine control flow to efficiently jump directly between ROP-like gadgets that emulate individual instructions as opposed to the more traditional interpreter emulation loop. A more modern example of this would be the UTM-SE project described here, which shows how efficient this type of emulator can be on more modern platforms like iOS where JIT is disallowed. So yeah, there's a similar problem with iOS devices. Uh, you can see from this UTM project that he's talking about here, which is basically a featured emulator, a system emulator, like a virtual machine host for iOS that allows you to run Windows, Linux uh, on your Mac or iPhone. So the thing with this is that JIT is disallowed on iOS devices. You have to have a specific version of iOS that has some kind of vulnerability that can be used to enable JIT or a jailbroken iOS device in order to enable JIT functionality. However, this particular program here can be ran on any iOS device supposedly, or I guess any modern iOS device, even one that isn't jailbroken or doesn't have any of these vulnerabilities to enable JIT. And the way that it's doing that is it's using the slow edition, which uses a threaded interpreter, which performs better than a traditional interpreter, but still slower than JIT. This technique is similar to what ISH does for dynamic execution. As a result, UTM-SE does not require jailbreaking or any JIT workarounds and can be sideloaded as a regular app. And if you check out this other project, this ISH project, which seems to be like a Linux terminal that can be ran on iOS devices, in here he states that using a similar technique here, he was able to get a speed up of roughly three to five times compared to pure emulation. So essentially, what CTERT's talking about here is yes, the emulator runs a lot slower. You can use these kind of threaded interpreter or weird machine type techniques to significantly improve the efficiency of the emulator to get it to run much faster. But as clearly stated here uh, with the UTM project, it's still, it's faster than a traditional interpreter, but it's still slower than JIT. So it would still be running slower than it would run normally. So he addresses that here by saying furthermore, when considering the scenario of trying to run PS4 games on the PS5, some amount of overhead might be offset by the fact that the PS5 runs faster than the PS4 anyway. So even though with these emulator techniques, it's still going to be slower than running it normally, but because the PS5 is a much more powerful system than the PS4, and you're using it to run PS4 games, then there's some overhead already available there on the PS5 because it's a much faster system, and that overhead might be able to make up for the shortfall in efficiency in the compilation process. But this is obviously very complicated stuff. It would be a hell of an undertaking to actually implement this. I also don't know if you would have to kind of like tailor the emulator in this case to specifically for each program that you're trying to run, uh, which would be a headache in and of itself, or if you could just have a one size fits all kind of thing. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, in conclusion here, he says there's a reasonably good chance that with enough motivation, the vulnerabilities described in this post could be exploited to take over the compiler process. The exploit would allow arbitrary code execution on the latest firmwares on the PS4 and the PS5, allowing native homebrew applications to be run off a USB storage, for example. So even working within the 65 megabyte budget without doing these two techniques here, there is still a good chance that somebody will be able to figure out how to implement this exploit to be able to run native PS4 homebrew apps and maybe emulators that are made for the PS4 that could be run using the Mastercore exploit in the same way that we currently run our PS2 ISOs with the Mastercore exploit. That's definitely on the cards 100%.
Now, these other two things here of getting PS4 games to run uh, by using these techniques with paging or by using these kind of threaded compiler emulator type techniques, those are going to be a lot more complicated and unlikely that anybody's really going to go to that length to actually get that working. But you never know. As said here, even with the mitigation Sony shipped in response to this research to limit the size of the applications that could be run, I still believe it would be possible to run larger applications, albeit with performance overhead of them being partially emulated or dynamically paged in and out. With the amount of work required, I don't realistically think we'll see polished demos of Linux or retail PS4 games running, but it's fun to think that there's a good chance that theoretically those things might at least be technically possible. So yes, it's going to be a huge undertaking to actually get these two sections here, uh, you know, the dynamically paged stuff or using the emulator technique. Those things are theoretically possible, but are ex an extreme undertaking to actually get that working. So the chances that, you know, somebody will actually go to the length of getting that working is possible. But it's unlikely. I mean, yes, people have done similar things with iOS devices, but you've got to bear in mind that the iOS kind of hacking community, I believe, is quite a bit larger than the PS4 hacking community. So the chances that um, we're going to get something like this where we're going to be able to run native PS4 games is unlikely, but it is technically possible. Uh, whereas running PS4 Homebrew and other smaller apps that are within the current JIT budget that is definitely likely and we could potentially see developers, maybe Macaulay could implement this, who knows, or maybe somebody else in the scene, The Flow, or any of the other uh, devs or exploit devs in the scene could potentially uh, implement that. And then at the end here, he thanks some other developers, I guess, who had some involvement. We've got Flats, uh, Belika011, The Flow, Chicken S, uh, or Chickens, and PlayStation. So what I expect to see next would be somebody to actually implement this second part and hopefully release it uh, where we could potentially run PS4 homebrew and emulators made for the PS4 rather than the PS2 running using the Mastercore exploit on the latest firmwares for the PS4 and PS5. As for running native PS4 apps, it's technically possible, but it may be a long time before we see that, or we may never see that at all because of the work that would be involved in making that possible. But you never know. Again, like I said before, some of these hackers are practically wizards with this kind of stuff, so you never know what they can come up with. So there's also no mention of using this to run native PS5 apps, so that's probably out of the question. That may not even be possible with this particular exploit. And also when it comes to running PS4 games, we're talking about running it within the PS5 because it has the additional horsepower, the additional overhead to make up for the efficiency loss, which the PS4 would not have. So using the Mastercore exploit on the PS4, even with these two techniques, it may still not run things smoothly enough to be able to run or sideload other PS4 games and run them on your PS4 that's on the latest firmware. It may only be feasible at this point for the PS5. Anyway, that's it for this video. Hope you guys enjoyed this general overview of part two of the Mastercore exploit. If you liked this video or found the information useful, please leave a like and subscribe and I'll hopefully see you guys in the next one.